something missing here a still small voice just keep dismissing do you know how it feels to be troubled inside and thank just for you on the cross someone died do you know how it feels when he knocks to surrender and have your sins washed away never to be remembered and to know that it's real tell me do you know how it feels then how does it feel to know you're a child of the king your heavenly father he owns everything how does it feel to know you are loved by the one who created the stars up above how does it feel to know you're all right when you lay your head on your pillow each night and you know that it's real tell me do you know how it feels and do you know how it feels when your cold heart is melted Tears started flowing the moment you felt it. Do you know how it feels to know you've been changed and think that the whole world has been rearranged? Do you know how it feels whenever you roam? You still get a feeling you're not at home knowing heaven is real. Tell me, do you know how it feels? Then how does it feel? child of the king your heavenly father he owns everything how does it feel to know you are loved by the one who created the stars up above how does it feel to know you're all right when you lay your head on your pillow each night and you know that it's real tell me do you know how All right, let's stand together, please. It does get gooder and gooder, doesn't it? <clears throat> All right, let's. Uh, I'll, I'll go play Power in the Blood. Y'all can shake hands. And, uh, actually, don't shake hands, just fist bump or whatever people are comfortable doing. Say hello to somebody. And uh, go ahead and drop all of your, um, your $20,000 checks in the offering boxes back there. And then make your way back to your seat. And we'll sing another song in just a few minutes. Let's sing a verse of There's Power in the Blood. I have no idea. Let's see. Let's sing the one that's on the screen. <laughs> Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or even? 
people of victory win. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You can be seated. the stars one and all he knows how much sand is on the shores he sees every sparrow that falls he made the mountains and the seas he's in control of everything of all creatures great and small and he knows my name every step i take every move that i make every tear that i cry he knows my name when i'm overwhelmed by the pain and can't see the light of day i know i'll be just don't know what tomorrow may bring I can't tell you what's in store I don't know a lot of things I don't know all the answers to the questions of life but I know in whom I have believed and he knows my name every step I take every move that I make every tear that I cry he knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain and can't see the light of day I know I'll be just fine Let's take our Bibles this evening. Thank you for all the music. Luke, thank you for your help. Find uh, the book of Revelation, if you would. We're just going to be there briefly, just to remind ourselves of where, where we're leaving off. And uh, so find the book of Revelation. And while you're finding that, let me make this announcement Brother Jerry asked me to make. Um, on Friday evenings, Friday evenings, we uh, have uh, Reformers Unanimous here at this church. I just put my... Uh, cough drop in the podium, so if you come up here, um, it's not a, just a freebie, okay? I mean, <laughs> you can have it if you want, but you may be getting more than you bargained for, okay? That's all I'm saying. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Oh, are you? Thank you. Are you on Friday nights? And um, they have quite a crowd down there. The way the, the program works, um, people from our church staff it and run it and, and help in that thing. And uh, lots of people have children and that, that they need to be watched, and so we have kids' classes for that. But sometimes there's young ones, babies, and um, it would really it would add a lot to that program. It would help that thing run a whole lot more, uh, I guess, more smooth than it is right now. If we could get somebody to work the nursery, um, now we don't need we don't need three people. We really just need one faithful person. Uh, that would run that nursery for us on uh, Friday nights, and uh, that starts at seven. And uh, Brother Jerry is not Miss Leslie. How how late would the nursery actually be running? 
to 9. So 7 to 9 on Friday nights. And I, that's, that's a sacrifice. I am fully aware of that, but I'm telling you that that would be a huge, huge help uh, to that Friday night Reformers Unanimous. And so would you please consider that? And um, if you're interested in that, let Brother Jerry or Miss Leslie know. And even if you're, if you're listening at home tonight because you can't be here, but you plan on, you plan on uh, returning to the church service, um, you don't have to currently be a part of Reformers to, to be in that ministry on Friday nights. We just need someone to come and help run that nursery. So uh, if you're looking for a place to serve, I'm telling you that would be a, that would be a, huge, uh, a huge help to that ministry. All right, uh, Revelation chapter 20 is what we're going to... Is what we're going to be in tonight. Revelation chapter 20. So we have, uh, we've been in Revelation 20 in this one passage for a long time. I, I know exactly how long we've been there, but I'm not going to tell you tonight because it'll just sound horrible. It's just depressing. But more than a few weeks, we've been in this one passage. And it's not like every service we're together, we're, we're in the book of Revelation, but when there's a space of time where I think we can take some more time and, and study it uh, for a couple of services in a row, that's, that's how, we, how we do this thing. We don't get in a hurry. We're not on a, we're not on a schedule. There's no deadline uh, to finish this. And so I think it's good for a church to always be working through a book of the Bible and, uh, and, and expositional style study. And I think that's really, now hear me, hear me clearly, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong not to. But I am saying that I think Christian growth, spiritual growth happens when you study the Bible the way God intended it and the way he gave it. He did not give one verse over here and then jump to where we would call another book of the Bible and give one verse. We, we, he gave it in letters and in book form. And so I think it just makes sense to study it in that way. And we certainly see nothing wrong with topical preaching. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think most spiritual growth comes from studying in an expositional way, verse by verse, line by line, and uh, doctrine by doctrine. Amen? We, we learn well that way. All right, Revelation chapter 20 is where we're at. Now, the period of time that, uh, that this little verse covers, the little passage covers, is a thousand years Everybody find, hold your, hold your finger right there, but find Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. All right, so hold your Bible in one hand and hold up the pages from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation 20. For me, it's about 20 pages. I think it's 28 pages right there, okay? That is much paper covers seven years worth of time. Seven years, okay? Drop it back open to Revelation 20. Pick up the page that Revelation 20, verse 1 through 7 are on. It's just one page, more than likely. There it is. That's a thousand years. A thousand years. So I hope you can understand why it has taken so long to get through these first seven or six verses of chapter 20. All right? It, it's not that it takes that long to just study the verses here, but the period of time that's covered is mentioned all the way through all of the major and minor prophets, including the books of prophecy of our, or poetry, rather, of our Old Testament. We find references in the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, that directly relate to this thousand-year period of time. We find several chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, as well as some other references in the other three Gospels, that directly relate to this thousand-year period of time. We find passages in First and Second Corinthians, as well as First and Second Thessalonians, that directly relate to this thousand-year period of time. Though it's rarely taught from those other passages about the thousand-year kingdom, we miss a huge opportunity if we just read these six verses and say, okay, that's the study of the thousand years. We, it's, it's not fair to Scripture because the chances are you're never going to sit down and do a study on the thousand-year kingdom and put it all together. It just doesn't happen very often. Some have done it, but it doesn't happen very often. So I figure while we're here, while we're covering this period of time, let's cover all the events of that period of time as they're found throughout our Bible. 
it'll make a whole lot of sense. And here's what people have told me since we've just in this passage, since we've just since since August 28th, okay? Since August 28th, since we've been in this passage, here's what people have told me. People have told me that they had no idea that some of the passages from the Old Testament that we're reading did not apply to the church age or the tribulation period. Because we're in a habit of just thinking that, well, if the Bible talks about all the nations of the earth coming together, then it must be tribulation period. Or if the Bible talks about sacrifices, well, that must be pre-church age. It, but it's not. It, it can be, it, you'll, you'll understand, by the time we get to the end of this period of time, you're going to understand it. And you'll walk away with a firm grasp on what it means when we refer to the millennial kingdom or the thousand-year kingdom. It'll make a whole lot more sense. So let's start reading in verse 1 of, of chapter 20. We'll get down to the end of verse 6, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll bow our heads one more time, and then we'll get a little bit further into the study of the millennial kingdom. Verse 1 says this, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, uh, that old serpent, which is the devil. And Satan and, and, ba- and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw, okay, so really verse four begins the information in Revelation chapter 20 about the thousand years. Here it is. And I saw thrones. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But, he, uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right, so there it is. That's what the book of Revelation has to say about the thousand-year kingdom. All right, it, is, it has to be amazing to us that we have really three verses dedicated to the thousand years and we've got 19 other chapters devoted to the seven years of tribulation, or three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. I have different theories that I wouldn't say I could prove dogmatically from Scripture, but I'll just say from an experiential standpoint. That is, in, in my own life, the way this impacts me, I think the seven years of great of tribulation and great tribulation on the earth, I think we find such great detail given to the church. I think it's given to us intended to be a motivator to accomplish the commission that we received in Acts chapter 1. We were told in Acts chapter 1 that we were to be witnesses unto Jesus Christ. We were to go into all the world and preach the gospel we were given that job now we find by the time we get to acts chapter 7 and 8 the church was not doing that job they were staying in jerusalem though there were thousands and i would even say tens of thousands of believers by the time chapter 8 of acts takes place we do not find them going anywhere else to preach Chapter 9 begins with great persecution. Paul making havoc of the church. The Bible says in those opening verses of chapter 9, it says that they were scattered everywhere, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel, really launching the Great Commission missions movement. Here we are some 2,000 years later, And those people that were alive back when Acts chapter 8 happened, when those people, they were excited about the Great Commission. They were fervent witnesses because they fully believed that before they died, Christ was going to come back. They were convinced of it. 
Man, you get over into the writings of, in, in the book of Hebrew and in, in, in the, the book of First and Second Peter, and you begin to read about what some of these folks were saying. They had lost, by the time those books were written, they had lost some of their enthusiasm. Man, they had adopted the mentality, as the Bible says, they had had from, from days of old. Well, they've been saying this since, since time began and nothing's ever happened. The Lord's not going to move. How long do we have to wait? Right? And then it's almost as though God used the apostle John to rekindle the fervor and the zeal of the first eight chapters of Acts. Because late into the life of the apostles, John was one of the longest living apostles, some say the longest living. The book of Revelation was written and then disseminated amongst the churches. And as they began to read the book of Revelation, I must believe it rekindled some of the passion they had for evangelism. Come on, how many times since we began the book of Revelation have we concluded Wednesday night services with an altar call not for salvation, but for evangelist. How many times have we finished around the altar begging God for another chance to tell our family and loved ones about Jesus Christ? I must believe that so much of the book of Revelation is spent on the first on those, of those seven years to motivate us into action. So shame on us if we just study it from an intellectual point of view instead of studying it from a spiritual point of view because it is a stark reminder of the, and I mean this literally, I don't mean it in a profane way, but the hell that is coming to this earth. It reminds us of this. And we hope for the rapture. Don't you hope for the rapture? If the, I think it could happen tonight. I do. And if it happens tonight, that means that the people on the earth right now, your neighbors, your neighbors, maybe your children or grandchildren, they will endure the next seven years of the hell that I just mentioned. Satan having his way on this earth. If that doesn't motivate you, then you cannot be motivated. Let's bow our heads. We'll pray, and then we'll get into these thoughts for this evening. Father, I need your help. God, help me be concise with my thoughts. Lord, give us clear, clear direction. God, please give me wisdom, and Lord, please speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let me give you real quick some of the things that we've already discussed that happen um, in this, in this uh, thousand-year kingdom. Um, the, let's see, let me find that beginning here. We found the judgment of the nations was mentioned. Um, we find the cleansing of the earth. We find the restoration of Israel. Uh, we have found um, the cleansing of the Palestine, the, the land over there. Uh, we have found um, the, the, the bringing back not just, the, uh, not, not just the, the national restoration of Israel, but the bringing back of some boundaries and landmarks over there. And then we, we kind of finished up with the regeneration. Uh, the Bible speaks of the regeneration that will take place at that time. And uh, we, we finished up with some of these thoughts. We saw that... Um, Part of that regeneration is that nature will be renewed, uh, regenerated, the, the curse on, on nature that took place back in Genesis chapter 3, that will begin to be reversed. We find uh, that animals will return to their peaceful existence. The Bible says this specifically. I gave you all the references for them last time. I can't re-preach everything uh, tonight. And then we found that nature, uh, the Bible says that nature in, in, intuitively, instinctively waits for and groans for that restoration. The Bible says that all of nature groans and, and waits for as a woman in travail. Just, just, just laboring, waiting for the day when God restores them, uh, all of nature uh, to its original uh, condition. We found that God will restore the tranquility and peace on earth that has not been experienced since before Eve's conversation with the servant, uh, serpent. Uh, God said he's going to restore uh, the peace and the justice and equality on the earth. We found that the ground will return to its original fertility. The Bible says in that day, during that millennial kingdom, things will be in such a state on the earth that the reapers will overtake uh, the, the sowers and the sowers will overtake the reapers. In other words, there'll be just one long growing season. There'll be abundance. It'll take forever to reap it and it'll be time to replant just as soon as you're done because the earth will be that fertile. Do you realize that's how God intended this earth to be from the beginning? That's how he intended it to be. Now, you know, Adam and Eve fouled all that up, but God says one day 
it's going to be restored. That's what the Bible says. We saw lots of references on this the last time we were together. We kind of left off there. So let me give these last two or three things real quick about the regeneration. Then I want to get into the thoughts for, the, for tonight. We find that in the regeneration, a man's pre-flood lifespan will be restored. Man's pre-flood lifespan will be restored. Now, you can think whatever you want to think of your pastor. I, 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 I honestly, I don't care. I'll, I'll answer to God one day for what I do with his word. I believe the Bible literally, when it says that the generations from Adam until Noah, when it describes that period of time and it gives the ages of some of those patriarchs being hundreds of years old, I believe it. I, hey, don't call yourself a Bible believer if you've got to start excusing away and finding an excuse for not believing the Bible. Don't do it. I believe there's a man named Methuselah. I believe that he lived a really long time. I believe by the time, by the, time the flood hit, I believe there were many, many generations of people on the earth. Hundreds of years old. Can you imagine I, I remember uh, Miss Shinneberry's mom, Miss Susanna Thompson, her, for her birthday here at the church. What birthday was that for her? Is that 100? It was 100, 100th birthday for her. They, did a, they put together something, and I forget what it all looked like, but they put together a, together a list of things that she had seen in her lifetime. And I remember thinking to myself, that's incredible. It seems to me like just my adult life has been taking place at breakneck speed. But I can't imagine hitting 100 or 101. Grandma Holiday was 103, I think, when she passed away. She played the piano for us on her 101st birthday. She played all for Tori for us. These people saw some stuff. But imagine living 800 years. I'll go you one better than that. Imagine having kids at 150 years old. <laughs> that'd be a trip, he says. Yeah, that'd be something. That, that's what the Bible says is going to happen. Let's, let's just read a few of these verses real quick. I can't read them all to you. We don't have time, but let me give them to you real quick. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 4 and 5 say this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall, uh, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for, for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. We find in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 18 through 24. I can't read the whole thing. Here's a part of it. Therefore, uh, there, there shall be no more defense an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days for the child shall die at 100 years old. Did you catch that? The child. A child is going to die at 100 years old. That's pretty impressive. Uh, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. And Amos chapter 9, verse 13, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the, re and the treader of grapes. Him that soweth seed in the mountain shall drop uh, a sweet wine. All the hills shall melt. It goes on in that passage to talk about uh, the full days and all those things. Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verses 12 through 13. Hey, some of these passages, they talk about, me and Brother James were talking about this the other day. Some of these passages, passages talk about people building houses, then living so long they have to rebuild their house. Right now, the rental house we're staying in, I think the realtor told us it was built in 1860, 70-something. It's an old, old house. Can you imagine building that house and then about 300 years later saying, man, this place is falling apart. I got I to gotta do some work around here. But that's what, that's what the Bible says. You believe it or don't believe it, that's up to you. You believe God can save the eternal soul of man with the spotless divine blood of his son, Jesus Christ? If you believe that, then why in the world can't you believe that God can let people live 800 years? Well, you don't really believe that God created everything in seven days or six days, do you? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. I believe God spoke the word. I believe it. Don't try to explain it away. Don't, don't think we have to rely on Darwin or some other theory to, to how things came to be. Either believe it or don't believe it. If you don't believe it, just man up and say, I don't believe the Bible. Faith Baptist Church, we kind of hold the Bible in high esteem. You understand, we base our eternity on the words of that book. Hey, don't come to me and tell me you don't believe all of it. If you don't believe all of it, then what part can you believe? It's kind of important. It's kind of important. I believe man's lifespan is going to be increased back to the way it was before the flood. And then this is kind of important, and so we'll spend a little bit of time on this. The geography of the earth during the millennial kingdom at the close of the tribulation period ends in that great battle, and we read about all of that. Uh, but the geography of earth is going to be much different. 
How many of you have ever looked at the world map? I got a map on my office wall, a gigantic world map. There's one back here. How many of y'all ever looked at that world map and noticed it looks like a puzzle? Uh, come on, we've, we've all done that. Now people have tried to figure out exactly how it all fits together, and I was never too good at puzzles. I'm certainly not good enough to do all that. But the Bible implies that eventually God's going to call the land together again. The Bible says that eventually, during that thousand years, at the end of all the earthquakes that leveled cities around the world, remember what we read about? All of that upheaval is going to level all the mountains except for one high hill. It's going to be where the holy city Jerusalem sits. Literally, all other nations will look up to Jerusalem. The Bible says there will be rivers flowing out of Jerusalem to all nations. I believe it. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 18 and 20 say this. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. Catch that? Kind of sounds like things are in chaos on the earth. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Things are going to be moving a little bit on this earth. It says that the earth is going to move and sway like a drunkard. That's more than just a slight continental shift. Zechariah chapter 14 if you were to read from the first verse through the last verse, we don't have time to read the whole thing and read your portion of it. It says, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall, shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, uh, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up. There it is. Jerusalem shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. That, that passage goes on to talk about the purifying of the waters. Remember the condition of things on the earth at the end of the tribulation period? Come on, the, 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 the seas are, are, are vile. They're contaminated. Most of the sea life is, has, has died. The rivers are, have turned to poison, turned to blood. There's... You, there's not usable water, but the Bible says at the end of it all, after that great battle, God's going to shift things around a little bit, level some hills, raise a hill, and out of that hill is going to flow living water. And it's going to flow it everywhere, Amen. providing people the living water that they so desperately need at the end of that tribulation period. Also, the living water that's so desperately needed to make the earth as fertile as the Bible says it's going to be. I think that what we're reading about is really more like what Garden of Eden was than anything we can imagine. Uh, that's my, my personal belief. I, I don't think it's possible for us to, to, to fathom what the earth was like before the flood. You do believe in the flood, don't you? I don't think we can fathom what the earth was like before the flood. I certainly don't think we can fathom what the earth was like before sin. Uh, one day we'll find out, though. We're, we're going we're to figure that out. All right, we could also go to Micah and read chapter 1. We'd find some more about, about the geography of the earth changing as well. All right, this is all during that thousand-year period. Now, let me, I've got, I've got five minutes. Let's begin answering the question. We won't finish it. Let's just begin it. What will worship be like in the millennium? Somebody came to me a few weeks ago. I don't know what I said during the, the sermon to, to provoke the thought, but they came in with a question. They said, since we refer to it as the Jewish millennial kingdom, and we, from Matthew 24 and 25 is where we pull these thoughts from, they said, what's the point of having the Jewish people as a nation in the millennial kingdom if there's going to be other nations there as well? I thought God was done with the nation of Israel. So that was the question. It's a fair question, isn't it? I mean, Jesus Christ died on the cross once for all, did he not? And so it's a pretty good question. So let's begin to answer the question, in that millennial kingdom, in that thousand years, what is worship going to look like? All right, the lamb has returned. He set up Jerusalem as his capital. He's ruling from Jerusalem. Listen, I, I mean that God in visible form, the lamb, 
is sitting in Jerusalem. I'm not speaking figuratively because the Bible doesn't speak figuratively about it. He will be there in visible form. Believe it. I can't fathom it, but I believe it. Let's see what worship is going to be like uh, during, that, during that millennial kingdom. First of all, what are some things that will be included in that worship? Number one, being taught the way of the Lord by the Lord himself. Isn't that something? Being taught the way of righteousness by righteousness incarnate. That'll be amazing, won't it? Let's see where we get this from. In Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah, being one of the major prophets, I would encourage you to, to, of course, read the whole Bible, but uh, the book of Isaiah can be somewhat confusing because it's... um, it's a series of prophecies that the Lord gave Isaiah. It's not like God sat down with Isaiah in Isaiah 1.1 and said, here's what I want you to see, and he wrote the book in the way he saw it. That's, that's not it. He, he saw many different visions and prophecies, and he wrote them down as he, as he received them. So you've got to be able to sort out what's, what's tribulation, what's millennial kingdom, what's eternity. Well, you've you got to be able to sort all that out. And with the help of other books in the Bible, you can, you can do that very easily. Isaiah chapter 2 says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Concerning what? Judah and Jerusalem. Hey, church, are we Judah or Jerusalem? No, we're not. When God in his word specifically addresses Israel, you would do very well for yourself to leave it with Israel. Can we learn from it? Absolutely. But there are some things that God only intended for Israel. There's a lot of error, everything from tithing, from the, from the Old Testament. People step into error when they think that anything in the Bible is God's in, God intended it for the church. You better be careful. This says that this is what Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. You hear that? Where's it going to be? It's in the very top. It's it's the highest point here. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he, who? The God of Jacob. And he, uh, for the God of Jacob, for he will teach us his ways. Can you imagine getting the family up on Sunday morning? All right, guys, get ready to go to church. Yes, ma'am, who's preaching today? Oh, it's the Lord. (laughs) Baptists are going to be in trouble. Because they will never again be able to use the excuse, well, that's the preacher's interpretation. You you can throw, well, I don't think that's what the Lord meant when he said that. (laughs) Really? Make an appointment and go see him in his office. It says that the people are going to say, hey, let's go to the Lord's house. He's going to teach us. I I don't know what that looks like. I, I, I don't know. But David says the same thing in Psalms. We find it similar in Zechariah. Where he's going to instruct righteousness in the earth. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty incredible. I would gladly step aside for that speaker. <laughs> we taught the way of the Lord by the Lord himself. Number two, people are going to be bringing gifts unto the Lord. To be bringing gifts unto the Lord. Isn't that an interesting thing? Well, preacher, why would anybody bring gifts unto the Lord? My kids bring me presents on my birthday and at Christmas. My kids are broke. They have no money unless mom or dad gives it to them. And I've been asked, the same thing I asked my mom and dad, can I have some money to go buy your Christmas present? Do I, why don't I just go buy it myself? 
It's because something given to me by my children, I can see it in what they give me. I, I, I can see that they put thought into it or that they didn't put thought into it. I, I can see that, boy, they got what they think I want instead of what they want. It, come on, it means something to us, doesn't it? You think I can't go buy my own ties? Yeah. But when someone takes time out of their day and takes money out of their pocket and goes and, and, and looks at a tie rack and says, is this something that pastor would want? Well, I think pastor would like this. That means something. It, and you're the same way. You're, you're the same way. So here, let's, let's read some verses together. In Psalm 68, verse 29 and 31, here's what it says. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem, I, or at Jerusalem shall, shall kings bring presents unto thee. Rebuke the company of spearmen and the multitude of the bulls with the calves of the people till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hand unto God. We find many of the Psalms are prophetic, and this one says there's coming a day where kings are going to bring gifts unto the Lord. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? In, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 2, you, you, you know the story. Some, some wise men come, and uh, they find the child, Jesus, with Mary, his mother, and they're in, they're in a house, and they come. Well, what did they come doing? You, you, know, you know the story. It, it says this. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And they had opened their treasures, and they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. That's interesting. It's the same concept. It's not that they think that this two-year-old child or three-year-old child needs some gold. Come on, what, what three-year-old has ever said, I really wish I had some frankincense? That's not the point. The point is these people came, they realized this is, this is God. Well, I got to do something to show him that I appreciate him. I got I to give him something that shows I'm sacrificing for him. It's the same concept in the millennial kingdom. People are coming from all over the earth. Isaiah says it even better a little bit later on. Kings and princes and noblemen bringing gifts unto the Lord of Jerusalem. Isn't that something? That's what worship's going to look like in the millennial kingdom. Those who... Oh, we better not go there. That's just what it's going to look like in the millennial kingdom. People will be... Hey, yeah, we are going to go there. The New Testament church has the opportunity to start that right now. Not just given an opportunity, but commanded to give that way right now. Corinthians says this. It says, let each man give as his heart purposeth. In other words, if you're walking by those boxes back there and you say, oh, this is going to hurt, but whatever. Just keep it. Just keep it. But if throughout the week your heart begins to, to burn inside of you and it says, boy, I wish I could just give something to the Lord. You know, preacher mentioned that missionary. I, I don't know why, but I just feel led to give something to that missionary. By all means, you get back there and drop it in as your heart purposes. Get used to giving that way. Because one of these days, there'll be people coming to see the Lord in his holy temple, bringing gifts just to say thank you. Just, Lord, I, I just want you to have this. It's going to happen. You can close your Bibles. Let's stand together. We can't go any further this evening. We're going to see three or four more things about the worship in the temple. And then uh, we're going to also answer the question, what will the teaching and preaching be about uh, in, uh, in the millennial kingdom? Think about it. You know what we preach? We preach Jesus Christ. Crucified, buried, risen. We, we, hey, we, we, we preach and teach repentance. You better get saved. You better get saved. Will there even be a need for that in the millennial kingdom? So what will be the topic? What will be the, the lessons taught? We'll answer some of these questions the next time we're together. The Bible says a lot about it.
and it's worth, it's worth seeing together, okay? I see the kids out there waiting on us, and so we're going to pray, and then uh, you can go back and grab a prayer list. We'll have a prayer time at the altar. Father, thank you. Thank you for the good attendance tonight. God, thank you for your word. And Lord, it's so amazing to try to sit back and as we study this and try to imagine what this is going to be like. Father, I can't, I can't imagine it. I can't understand it all, but Lord, I do believe it. God, would you increase our faith? And then, Father, would you help us not just say we believe it, but then, God, would you help us live like we believe it? Well, thank you, Lord. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll go play some little piano.